Sometimes people will discuss a subject and they'll get into the subject rather than the subject material that it's based upon. Sometimes we call that topical referencing where you can reference a topic and prove it according to a baseline of information as opposed to actually having the volume of information that may have the exceptions and the derivatives of that same topic. Grace is one of those topics. A lot of times people will objectify grace and make it into a subject material as opposed to an object of God doing something for us. And the reason why I say that is because the object of grace or grace having been given to us or given to us because of the accomplishment of Jesus is that we want to present accurately what the Bible says, what God says about grace because he's the one giving it to us. Grace is how we are saved. It's by grace you are saved and not that of yourselves, lest any man should boast, but it is a free gift of God. And we say we appropriate it by faith, but really we come into relationship with it by faith because when you appropriate something, it's being gotten by someone giving. In other words, you can't just go and take it. And that's what sometimes faith movements do, is that they have this attitude at times of somehow that because it's appropriated, they can get it by just claiming it, or I believe, and thinking that faith objectified without it being personified could be something that they can attain to through religious means without there having to be a relationship of interaction between two people, two equals as it were. Jesus was so equal with God that he chose not to be equal with God and submitted himself to the will of the Father and made himself lesser, lest he should take any glory away from the Father, though the Father had given him equality with him. The Son humbled himself and became a man so that he would be identified with us. When we identify ourselves with Jesus, we should be subservient to the will of the Father and we should be acceptance of the fact that grace is being given to us freely because of what Jesus has done, but also that it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be abused or cheapened. It's not something that didn't cost the Son of God or God himself. The reality is we've been given everything we need for salvation, but whether we do it or not is really the matter of the process of salvation working out from us as God is working in us to accomplish his work that will be called grace in the latter days. So when we talk about grace these days, a lot of times people are using legalism to enforce a works variation of no grace or all grace and no works meaning that somehow that there could be a process where hey grace grace you know you've been given grace so you don't have to do nothing well you know to put it bluntly yes you do I mean if you want to just talk turkey and talk reality fact checks as opposed to talking you know the application of the theological premises and predicates that participate in that application of grace to us, then we could talk straight, street lingo. Yes, you've been given grace and it's not a work, but the works of faith are such that it produces the same quote-unquote right perspective of doing something about your salvation that demonstrates that you have it as opposed to not having it. And that is that relationship that we talk about. That's why people in these latter days are so confused about relationship versus religion and they try to make it a conflict. It's not. They cooperate. They try to say grace versus works and try to make it a conflict. That as though they're in contradiction to themselves. They're not. As though law versus grace that they're in contradiction. They're not. And at times likewise we oversimplify the relationship of law, grace, works, faith, mercy, loving kindness, the accomplished work of Jesus on the cross and all those things by making it too simple with not including the volume of the book. And that's where I say that's why we do integral specificity but that's another reason why we need to look at where we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it's not an accomplished, it's not a fete accompli, it's not an accomplished fact that you have grace. I don't know if you do or not. I only know that grace 
is accomplished by the work that Jesus has done. Whether that's imputed to you by God is his decision. If he has done so, you have it. Do you know if you have it? No, you don't, <laughs> quite frankly. Because there's enough that's been said in the process of God's own salvation being made manifest that, no, God can choose at any point in time to apply or not apply according to what Jesus said because judgment has been given into his hands of whether he knows you or whether you know him. Because some people know of him and they talk about him and they prophesy in his name and they cast out demons in his name. And we can make that scripture fit when Jesus says, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And then we could say, oh, well, that's for the nations. Oh, that's not for the individual. That's only for, you know, when they're, you know, judgment of believers works. Really? I never knew there was a judgment of believers works because I can't find one in the scriptures. Sure, there are different types of judgments that are going on. There's different evaluations. But quite frankly, if you're cast out from Jesus and Jesus doesn't know you, I think your evaluation of salvation is in trouble. Because quite frankly, he who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son of God has not life. If Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you, I would say your salvation is cuckoo, gone bye-bye. In other words, you were the one who never had it in the first place. So it, for you, it was an evaluation of the salvation process that you don't have. But for others, it's an evaluation of their process of rewards for the works that they have done in their flesh according to that which God has said yes I do know you now let me reward you according to that knowledge and according to the things that you've done passing through fire as it were your works being tried as though they were of wood hay and stubble or whether they be precious gems jewels and those things that God has said would endure forever and really when you boil it down, the only thing that we come to the realization of in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ is that knowing Jesus is eternal life. Knowing the Father is eternal life. That's what it's all about. It's always been about Him and not about what we get or got or want or think we're going to have. Because part of what we would do in love is we would give it back to Him anyways. Wouldn't you? I would. So, reading studying, applying, and taking a lifelong look at grace, I'm not a legalist. <laughs> Believe me, I, I know what legalism is, and I, every smack dab implication of it brings you under the condemnation of the law. Once you apply one little law, you got all laws. But you're no longer under grace because the law only applied to your flesh anyway. So the law was only according to the flesh, according to Hebrews, and that of the body of death that you were living in, that you're like a zombie walking around with a spiritual life inside. You know, the zombie's going, oh, I eat flesh, you know, I eat flesh, you know, but the spirit of God inside you is at war with that zombie that you are. You're less a zombie and more a, hopefully, man of God and woman of God that God intended you to be. So, we look at grace with those open eyes of knowing that from Genesis we can find grace, from Revelation we can find grace, between the covers of the book, from grace to grace we've been given mercy and loving kindness. Those are the things that grace does for us. So it's not about a one-time effect that only happened once and never again, or that God doesn't have a way to apply His grace or not according to His own choice of sovereignty because that's where Christians like to argue about the sovereignty of God versus the grace of God as though you know God can't condemn someone because they've been given grace. I'm sorry, but God gets to determine whether they've been given grace or not because after all, man looks on the outward things, God looks on the heart, God knows. You don't. So at some point in time you find yourself back into you don't know, he knows, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So in that, we don't want to mistake what's been given to us, nor do we want to take in some extensional way of over extending what grace is. Grace covers a multitude of sins. Or love covers a multitude of sins. But grace applies to all of our sins so that we've been forgiven. But if we do not know the Son, we can still be condemned. So it's really kind of a catch-22 in some ways because people who argue don't know what God has done and people that accept it 
automatically fall into that relationship of love that they go into wanting to demonstrate that love by their works by their choice of choosing to live not their life according to their own flesh but after the things of the spirit choosing to honor and glorify God in all that they do and say and be so that they're living out grace and grace is changing them from day to day into the glory of the image of God, the incorruptible son of God so it's really not cheap but it doesn't cost us anything it's free but it does require of us there's responsibility to it there's also accountability to it there are things in other words if you boiled it down to the baseline where people want to know the brass tacks there are things you have to do in order for grace to be true the door is open why is it such good news I never need fear and say oh no I dare not go to God because I just told a lie <gasps> oh like God didn't know Ooh. I just lost my temper I just deceived that person oh no I have no right to ask God to help me because I failed in that task <laughs> woe is me I'm a man undone if my righteousness comes by my works then Satan can bar the door to God automatically and practically all the time because I am never doing as much as I feel like I should I'm never as good as I know I ought to be oh I should not have done that or I should have been better I haven't achieved my super ego I haven't lived up to my own standards of what I feel is right because I've failed to achieve those ideal or idyllic standards Satan will use my failure to keep me from coming to God by giving me a guilty conscience you have no right to ask God to help you when you have just failed him again and again and again. You know, there's a line you know not where that God was sworn he will not cross. You know your actions is displeasing to God, yet you do it anyhow. You know now you're in trouble, now you want God to help you. You think he's going to listen to you? No way. God doesn't care for you. No. because your works have separated you from God your sin has separated you from God you haven't done the right thing Satan can always bar the door to God if he can cause me to look within myself and at myself but if I'm looking to Jesus and I realize that I am accounted righteousness by my faith in Jesus and what he's doing then Satan can never bar the door because Satan can only accuse us of what we have what we are doing not what God has done and God has already imputed to anyone that would believe in Jesus the righteousness of his son and he's already deemed to his son being righteous so because he's already said that Jesus is righteous we have been given that righteousness by God when Satan accuses us oh he still comes to me and says you know Chuck you're a rotten wretch. You have no right to stand up in front of people and proclaim the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. I saw your attitude. You know, you you blew it. You know, and, and, and remember that last time, that last study. You know, you know, you know remember that last. Study? Yeah, yeah. You have no right to stand up there and teach the word of God. You have failed in this area and you have failed in that area, and you're a mess. Well, you know, I always start to smile when this happens because I'm sure I've gotten by with a few things, and I know there are a few things he hasn't even brought up. So I say to him, Satan, you don't scare me with your accusations. You're not going to cause me to run off and hide someplace. In fact, I know that what you say is true. I have screwed up. I have failed. I do fail, and I shall fail. I know that I have failed, and I know that I have a weakness. But you don't drive me from Jesus. You are driving me to Jesus. Because my only hope is in the cross of Jesus, and the fact that he died rose again and God accepted his sacrifice for my sin that I can't be forgiven except through him and so I flee to the only place where I am safe the only place where I have any hope at all surely I have no hope in my own self that's obvious and my own righteousness because after all I can't do the right thing all the time there are times where I fail and that's how grace applies when I fail but I have great hope in the work that Jesus did for me and in the work God is doing in me by the power of his Holy Spirit as he is conforming me into the image of Jesus. By grace, he is changing me day by day. For where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And grace is applied to my sin in accordance to causing me to not 
feel guilty, but to be changed from the issue of sin and corruption that's in my life to put on incorruption. Those things that I cannot do for myself, he is doing for me. Those areas where I was so weak, he has made me strong. Just like a father holding the hands of a child when they're walking and learning to walk, so too my Father in Heaven is teaching me and guiding me by holding my hands. I have recognized my weakness and I have cast myself helplessly upon him. I have no righteousness of my own. I have no perfection. I am not a saint, but a sinner saved by grace. In those areas where I was once weak and constantly stumbling, now I stand strong because his strength has been made perfect in my weaknesses. See 2 Corinthians 12.9 Because I acknowledge my sin, God has removed it from me. Certainly I am not yet all that God wants me to be, far from it. But thank God I am not what I was. Even in my present state of imperfection, God looks upon me and accounts me righteous and holy. That is why I never want to be caught anywhere except in Jesus. We must never see ourselves apart from him, nor would we ever want to be found without him. So in everything and in all our ways, we should acknowledge him that he may direct our path and that we may be found in Jesus all the days of our life as we walk with him. So that as God looks at us, as God evaluates us, as God sees the things we do and hears the words we say, he might be found to have seen and only known the righteousness of his son in looking at us. Because surely if he looked directly to us, we would be found imperfect. But when he looks at us, then he sees his son because of the blood that covers us. So in some ways, Passover is over, but in some ways it's still being accomplished as the blood covers us, as Jesus has imputed to us his righteousness, so that we no longer need fear, but we can go to God our Father and be drawn near unto him who is perfect, so that our imperfection could put on perfection.